So we are here today with the wonderful, delightful Brad Werner, and I am honored that he's uh, agreed to be part of this. So how are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> now you're from Canada, correct? That's right. Yep. I'm in, in the West. Canada are you? I'm in British Columbia, so that's on the West Coast, um, Pacific Ocean. Uh, I was for the last 20 years, I've been in Victoria, but I just recently moved in the last six months. So I'm in the middle of the province now. And so, um, and we, we bought a house up here. So it's, it's been a big change. <laughs> so what, how, uh, are you, you have a family? Um, I have, um, I'm married. So my partner, Erin, she, uh, she also helps out with the website and whatnot. She's a pianist awesome. and a writer. Awesome. Very cool. And you're yeah. born in Canada as well? Yeah, yeah. I was born in Vancouver, actually. Nice, um, nice. But I grew up in a little town called Nelson, and then and I've been around, well, you know, back the, and forth. All the artists we've interviewed have been born in different places and then resided in different places all over the globe and country. So I always like to know what the background of each uh, performer and artist is all about. So right. where, 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 where are you located? I'm in Florida. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to mute the sun behind me, but it just keeps coming through. Well, it's good to have sun. Yeah. So tell us about the early days of how you got started playing the guitar and what your exposure was. Yeah, um, I guess in some ways, like my I my father died when I was younger. So it was just my mother raising me. And in some ways she wanted me to have hobbies, of course. But she also wanted me to have like some kind of like a male figure <laughs> around um so but i she asked me you know what i want to study and i said guitar and i probably that was around like eight years old and i probably didn't know what that meant uh but we we found a classical guitar teacher and i i doubt that in my eight-year-old mind i was thinking classical guitar but that's the the way we went and um i didn't practice i i was a bad student bad bad student <laughs> how long did that bad student go on for well my mother actually made me sign like a contract um that i would if she was going to pay for these lessons i would have to take it for at least five or six years wow regardless if i was practicing or not i just had to stick with it for you know that many years um and after that time period went by um i actually i kind of just switched to more like electric guitar and was playing more like heavy metal and stuff like that and and a little bit of like jazz as well um but th those those couple of years of classical guitar starting off i did learn to read music and i didn't practice much but I, I read music and i played duets with my teacher and um i was terrified of performing so i remember one performance actually where i really i went up on stage and i was trying to play something by memory and um i just i couldn't play a single note i didn't even know the first no. And so my teacher like brought up a music stand and put the music there. And I looked at the music, nothing, <laughs> nothing came out. And then my teacher just started clapping and I walked off stage. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was a good, have those stories. that was a good performance uh, experience, but. Um, so when did it start to click for you that this was something you wanted to do? Well, like I said, so I started playing more electric guitar and I played in some bands and stuff like that. And we did like, you know, little recording albums and stuff like that. And then um, I moved away from home um, and went down to the coast um, of in, in British Columbia and um, played in some bands and stuff like that. And I had this like dream of becoming like the next John McLaughlin. I wanted to like Mahavishnu Orchestra rock out. <laughs> Um, but I also was missing classical guitar. So I took classical guitar lessons at a conservatory and, um, and also prepared for, um, entry to a jazz school, a, a, a well-known jazz school in Vancouver. So I kind of, and then I went to Vancouver and lived there and went to jazz school and, um, but I'd always been taking classical guitar kind of, you know, on the side of all this, even at jazz school, I was studying with um, Stephen Boswell in Vancouver. And um, I just, you know, I kept missing it. And jazz was a, it's a big world. And it, I love jazz, but it wasn't, 
the primary thing I wanted to do, I guess. I, I liked compositions um, and I like solo playing and I like the ensemble work with, with compositions. So I ended up leaving jazz school and, and then just studying actually classical guitar for like four years, just open-endedly, like classical guitar, composition, theory, musicianship, just open-ended, no post-secondary program. And that's when I started to really get serious and uh, inspired and um, and having all that free time for like four years and not being in a program where I was rushed. Um, I played full concerts, like full repertoire concerts uh, during that four years. And I wasn't rushed. It wasn't for, it wasn't adjudicated. It was, it was really great. And then I did a college program after that. But those four years of just ha- letting teachers just teach me whatever I needed to know with no schedule was um, really amazing, actually, and I, I wish everyone could do that. Uh, it's not always possible, but uh, it was that was definitely when I um, really dive into classical guitar. We have very, very similar paths, and that's why I love your story. Because when I look at your website and the things that you're teaching and your approach and the repertoire you're using and the methods, it's very similar to how my experiences were. What were some of the early methods and composers that you really latched onto? Um, Well, as a, as a child, I grew up using the, the old um, Frederick node solo guitar playing book, which looking back at it now, like it's not my favorite book, but the thing I do really appreciate is at the beginning of that method book, it's, it's all duets. You just play with your teacher, like for the first, learning all your notes, it's just duets. And I think that's um, an incredibly musical approach. It teaches students to kind of play in time and forces them to be musical um, and listen to playing along with the teacher. Um, so that was, that was a big one. When I got into electric guitar, well, I, you know, and I went through some of the Royal Conservatory books, which is the Canadian, um, you know, um, system that graded system that we have examination system which isn't a curriculum but it's a it's just a graded um, examination system um but you know when my electric guitar years i really dove into like jazz books and so like learning the fretboard like um yeah i i really like learned all my triads and and um our you know triadic arpeggios and scales like over the entire guitar neck and not just like from tonic to tonic, like one octave or two octave scales, but like just all the notes in a position and how they connect all the way up the neck Um, rather than like, and I did do Royal Conservatory scales, which are like similar to the regular, you know, two octave Segovia scales or whatever. Um, But that jazz kind of practice of just learning the entire fretboard and like really understanding how to use music on the fretboard rather than just like barfing out a scale. Um, was was really helpful because when I came back into a classical guitar more seriously and I did something like the sheer scale supplement book that huge boring book um, I knew all the yeah it's it's crazy 270 pages of just sight reading melodic patterns I know bang Um, but I already knew all the I already knew all the patterns like uh, that was no problem I already knew the patterns when I dove back in and was upping my sight reading skills um, it was easy I like but I knew the patterns already. So like, I just had to kind of like do the practicing. Um, And I I think that was very influential to me. Uh, I don't know, maybe if I had just studied like strictly technique, uh, maybe I'd be a slightly stronger player, (laughs) but, um, but I'm very comfortable with the fretboard and I I know my fretboard quite well. So I'm happy about that, (laughs) but everyone, you know, it's different for everyone and you have to kind of go through all these different stages. And of course, teaching um, helped a lot with understanding the guitar. I do notice that a lot of um, people like yourself, myself, and some others who had the opportunity to study some jazz before the classical, a lot clicked, it dominoed because of the jazz theory. And like you said, the fretboard. Did you ever do any of the Van Epps stuff? Um, A little bit. I never got my hands on his book um, because he has one or two like intense chord books right yeah, and i remember i still have the first edition that i mess around with i remember seeing it and probably i saw it like a long time ago and it was like there was too many notes <laughs> like crazy chords um 
but um, no, like I went through a lot of those, like, you know, the Berkeley books, which are horrible, kind of they're those old um, Berkeley modern method, but they're actually, they're kind of, they're kind of cool. If you have friends to experiment the material with like uh, to use them in improvisation or use them in even just songwriting, but the books themselves are kind of boring. And that's the thing about classical guitar methodology is like a lot of it's based on just technique. It's not really about understanding the fretboard that much. Um, I still don't really know any books that for classical guitar that really explore the fingerboard outside of like, just trying to teach students to be able to read some basic music. So. Yeah, I mean, it's a, a very valid point. So let, let's talk about some methods and some composers that you have showcased on your website that I feel are lacking the attention they deserve. And those two would be Aguado and Mertz. Hmm. Well, I don't really have any Aguado on my site. Sure? <laughs> well, I've got a little bit. I've got a little bit. Yeah, but not that much. I do have lots of merits. Um, yeah, um, part of my site, I mean, part of the site is like, I'm using public domain music because um, of copyright issues. So some of the modern music interests and new music interests that I have aren't just showcased as much. But um, one of the things for me was like, uh, the access to materials for students is pretty, is not great, especially up on the West Coast of Canada, for example. And um, I, I definitely want my, wanted my students because the site was kind of created for my students. So I, I wanted to give them access to performance pieces that were practical and sounded pretty good and weren't in the Royal Conservatory books. And even though lots of the pieces on my site are in the Royal Conservatory books, uh, the, you know, I'll, I, I definitely actively seek out pieces that are not and maybe neglected because um, uh, it's just a great way to offer students some alternatives. I'm also very interested in a specific like intermediate level of pieces that um, are great for students to perform and don't have a ton of like awkward hurdles, but are a little bit significant um, because I think more people should just be playing slightly easier repertoire. Um, but, you know, they, they want to play the harder pieces like Lagrima and stuff like that because they're just, they're, they're pretty good pieces. But, you know, the level, it's tough for people. They need more foundational level pieces um, and more that are still musically kind of mature. So I, I definitely actively seek those out. I also have a personal love of early music. Um, so, um, and I'm very comfortable reading like French lute tablature and stuff like that. So um, transcribing those works is, is definitely a huge interest as well. A hundred percent. I think the early music is also lacking in the love and attention out there. And yes, people are trying to play above their level for sure. Um, let's talk a little bit about Renaissance music since it's not an area that comes up a whole lot these days. What do you love about it? What are you looking for in pieces? What do you want people to feel? Uh, and also from the teaching perspective. Well, a lot of my interest doesn't really come from guitar players very much. Um, it's definitely from the lute world and, and just the early music um, world in general. Like when I go to concerts, I definitely like always buy my early music um, subscription to concerts. And I love seeing vocal ensembles, particularly early music vocal ensembles are, are just fantastic. And, and, um, and, and there's also something about the early music scene that I really like. Um, they don't seem as interested in their instrument. They seem more interested in the time period and the music itself. Um, whereas sometimes if you go to a guitar concert, you know, like it's, it's a lot of, there's a lot of talk about the guitar. It's about the guitar almost as much as it's about the music. Um, and I like in the early music scene where it's like, they really don't talk about the instruments outside of their historical, you know, significance. And so they're, but they're very interested in the repertoire and they're very interested in, in showcasing the music and collaborative ensembles and stuff like that. So I really like that aspect. I also like in the lute repertoire too, I really like the, the level. Uh, the level is, is not, it's not outrageously showy. It's, it's not that it's easy. It's, it's not because it's, it's difficult on like a sophistication level with, you know, there with, with 
Renaissance counterpoint and, and voice leading. It's very quite virtuosic in the sense of like voice connection, but not like in terms of like necessarily showy playing, um, which is, is, is very refreshing and, and very, a very musical approach. Not to downplay, um, you know, late romantic virtuosity or something like that. There's a musicality in that music as well. But it's it's just a different vibe, and and I'm I'm very attracted to that that kind of feeling and that vibe. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I, it, it's really amazing to hear you talk like that. I, I would take an early music concert consort over a symphony any day of the week. Uh, it just transports us to a whole other place. So, what are you doing with when you're teaching and you're taking people through the different things, are you starting them off with early music and then building from there chronologically or not really? No, not with students. Um, I, for students, like I have a pretty clear trajectory for them. Um, when, I, when they're starting off, I mainly just, I just give them the most ergonomically comfortable repertoire. <laughs> I hope some of it's kind of musical and creative but it's it's ergonomically comfortable repertoire so nothing strange over here nothing strange over here until they are able to hold their hands properly that's the main point um and i and i do inc always encourage lots of ensemble music so they have listening skills um and i also usually divide the lesson into like strictly skill-based costco guitar playing so reading music, technique, all those things. But then we also have always like a side section, like always ensemble projects with other students, large ensembles and small ensembles, and also um, other styles of music. So popular music, jazz, um, any other style of music to get them exploring music in a different way that's away from notation maybe, or at least away from the classical um, box that's set. That box is very important to provide structure, but I, too many teachers use it exclusively and the students don't seem to learn to either play by ear or to just naturally enjoy music or enjoy their instrument or to explore their instrument. The classical model tends to really emphasize a lot of like strict following directions rather than exploring your instrument naturally. And so I always encourage, whether it be popular music or, or jazz or or just some kind of like transcription project, you know, for kids, if they, want to, if they want to figure out their video games by ear, that's great, you know, I'm happy for them to, to find, use their instrument as, as a tool, like it should be used. Um, so, and, and to also not get too stuck in the classical model, which I'm definitely imposing upon them, um, especially if they're kids, um, because they don't know what, classical music is or rock music is or anything really they just want to play music so um I, diversity of musical content is definitely a, a goal do you do much with ear training with them um not until like a little bit later on we sing lots i try to encourage my students to become comfortable singing it's something that students aren't as comfortable with anymore i don't think they really sing in school as much anymore. And like most students feel very self-conscious singing. And um, what they need to get comfortable with is the idea is like, we're not talking about singing well. You can sing out of tune. You can sing horribly. You can sound scratchy. Um, that's all okay. But, you, you know, there's no ego in music study. There has to be like, you just, it's, you do it. You do the activities. You should be able to sing your phrasing so that you have an idea of what true legato means, you know, connecting the notes with your voice and then trying your best on the guitar to make it somewhat legato. Um, so, yeah, in, in that regard, later on, of course, there's ear training. Um, I don't use the Royal Conservatory examination system, but I'll sometimes use it as um, every few years, like as a touch up to make sure I haven't forgotten to teach my students some things. And um, because sometimes, you know, using their system for ear training might help, but really I don't, I don't, their system of ear training is like, learn these intervals now. And now next year we'll learn a different set of intervals, but maybe they'll just forget the previous intervals. It's not very helpful as opposed to like learning to sing your scales and, and things like that. So I, I absolutely love what you just said, that there's no ego in musical study. I think that should be a motto 
that you should market that, put it on a hat, put it on a t-shirt. That's a phenomenal statement that you just said. It's very powerful and it has a lot of layers to it. Well, I had to overcome a lot of that because I, I, I was, um, I, I did study classical music early on, but I was never that great of a student. And um, there was a lot of skills that I was not comfortable with. Singing in front of people, sight singing, um, ear training, lots of playing by ear, um, lots of that I was very self-conscious about. And so when I started, when I went to college, of course, you have to like sight sing in classes and stuff like that and do sight singing and ear training exams. So that was one like crazy ego kill it like just crushed me a little bit but for the for the better brad um later on it was playing ensemble music like i played in this little group called the victoria guitar trio and um working with other musicians um when it, you're in a rehearsal situation you're playing like we played all pretty much new music um if there's a problem in the ensemble it has to be addressed like it, it just has to be and you have to be comfortable telling your fellow friend and colleague, you're doing it wrong. Or them telling you, like, Brad, I think you're doing it really, really wrong. And, and you have to be comfortable with that. And you have to want them to tell you that you're doing it wrong. Lots of people hide um, behind their egos and things like that. But everything has to come out in the open in music. If you want the product to be good, um, it has to come out. Every little thing, you can't hold back. And you have to like laugh with people and um, have a good time, not pointing out their flaws, but making the, just making the music better. And, um, and I, I try to get my students comfortable doing that both with each other and with me, you know, getting them to try to point out the things that maybe I may be doing wrong when they spot me do like kind of fake it in their lesson or something like that. So, yeah, I just think it's, it's a really important fact and it actually has to actively be taught and practiced. So. Yeah, I, I definitely feel that there is a, a vulnerability that needs to be exposed in order to become intimate with your instrument, for sure, 100%. So let's talk about notation versus tablature. I know on your website you offer both and it's a hot topic and I love to hear everybody's perspective. I'm a bit of a snob, self-admittedly. I'm all about notation. And I think that to study the instrument, it's essential. So let's hear your take on it. Well, my method books don't have tab. Um, well, like my first two method books. So, and I get, I get flack for that for sure because the rest of my site has tab, but my method books don't. That's because I use my method book with my students and um, I don't let them use tab. I let them use tab for rock music. Sure. Um, because like, I want them to know how to use tab. I think it's important that you at least know how. And later on, it might even be like an avenue towards early music as, as well. But no, I don't know that the tab on my site is purely, I mean, I hate to say it on an interview, but it's purely for financial reasons. It's like, it's like people want the tab, so I provide it and they, they pay for it. And as you, people that use my site know that I give... Um, a, a fair amount of music away for free in the notation versions, but I often charge for the tab versions. In fact, I don't know if I give, I only give like a couple pieces away in tab. Um, it's purely financial and that's connected to the fact that the site was built for my students and I wanted to provide the notation additions to them for free. Um, but then when I started to have lots of worldwide customers, yeah, I started to provide the tablature, but I, I never wanted to charge any of my students. And they knew that if they brought classical pieces in with tab, I wouldn't let them use it. Um, it's, you know, though, I'm mixed. I mean, I have to, I have to be open to the fact that not everyone is trying to become a high level classical guitarist. Not everyone is even doing it in with the frame of mind of music education. And so I'm, I'm sympathetic to the fact that for the, some, you know, especially for people that come from a rock background, they just want to play a couple pieces and, and they want to use tab and that's fine. You know, they want an in to classical music. And if that's their in, then very well, fine. But no, no notation is like definitely far superior. There's no question. Uh, notation, it's a universal language. So other instruments can understand what you're doing. Um, it's your avenue to understanding the music, the composition and music theory. Um, there it's more communicative in terms of musical ideas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, hundred percent notation, but yeah, there's a place for tab too. So 
uh, I'll accept that. A hundred percent agreed. Totally. Um, let's touch on something that you kind of mentioned in what you were just talking about that not everybody's in this to be, you know, professional. I've always felt that there's that cloudy, hazy, elite line. Every, there's a lot of snobs out there. Oh yeah. Um, I'm a realist. I'm all about play your level, play your passion and, you know, whether you're, and I, but I'm a serious player and a serious teacher, but let's address that because people are intimidated by what they think classical guitar is. Yeah. Although we're lucky compared to other instruments. I mean, there's, <laughs> there's other instruments that are a lot more elitist than, than we are, at least in the guitar. There's, there's always going to be some blending of like of jazz and South American music and rock and all sorts of things. Um, it's definitely a more open um, culture, although, but yeah, there's definitely a, you know, hardcore snobbery to in the, in the, especially in closed circles of the classical guitar world. I would say that's less so with the younger generation, you know, when we were growing up, there wasn't much classical guitar to listen to. You went down to the record store and all you got is like John Williams and Julian Bream and Scovia. There wasn't, there just, and maybe Leona Boyd and like, and Parkening and a few others, but like, there just wasn't much. The younger generation now and with YouTube, like it's just all over the place. So I, I think that's, I think that's changing. But um, yeah, that, that snobbery is definitely a disease. When it comes to teaching, it's, it's a, yeah, it's a real tough one because um, I don't want to force students into classical guitar. But the problem is, is if they get into it later, it's, it's an issue because in order to reach higher levels in classical guitar, you just need so much foundation of good pedagogy and good training. And the, the problem with like students who kind of take it up casually and then they read tablature and then they don't really study technique properly, it's that they might actually get good. At, and at some point they might say like, I wanna go to music college for classical guitar. But then the teacher is going to have to say like, ah, oh, you know, I didn't, I didn't really expect you were going to say that. <laughs> and I didn't quite prepare you for that. And, and so there's a real divide when it comes to reaching higher levels and studying with um, some of the great teachers is that you, you need all that past training. And most people don't have time to do both serious classical guitar training and kind of a big open um, experience like like I had or some other people had. So I feel, I feel for them. And usually it results, especially in classical guitar, it just results usually that the student just can't, um, they need to take some years and, and build up a, a strong foundation after the fact. It's usually also the case that we start later in life with guitar. Um, we're not starting at two years old, like a violinist um, or something like that. So it's, it's tough um, because that elite line is also a, a great trajectory towards very high level playing, but I don't believe in it. So <laughs> yeah, it's a real tough one. It's a, it's a, it's a total mess in my mind. Yeah. I, I think, you know, we need to open up all the doors and let everybody kind of meander in and out so that they get exposed from, you know, the people who came from one lineage or the hobbyist. Um, and, and you're hundred percent correct. I'm not sure how old you are, but I'm assuming by what you're conveying, we're probably close in age and yeah, there wasn't yeah, a I'm, lot available. Yeah. I'm 39. So. Oh, you're young. Anyone needs. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'd kill to be 39. I'm 54. So okay. when I was in college there, yeah, it was Segovia, Brian, uh, you were still wearing a tuxedo to do a recital. Yeah. And yeah. now with like what you said, these young people, they have YouTube, they're not wearing the tuxedo. Wow. I'd give anything to be a student again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and yeah, there's so many more role models now, uh, especially for female players. Um, growing up, there was very little role models. Uh, it was pretty sad. And um, now there's just so much. And all, within e all these role models that exist now, um there's different styles so it's not just three high level concert players there's these you know there's people like Roland Dion's who is he a classical guitarist i don't know is he a jazz player i don't know uh he's like you know he's a phenomena so like if he's your role model i don't know what type of music you're playing <laughs> 
So let's talk about uh, some of your experience working with other musicians, because that's an area that also needs to be talked about. You worked yeah. with ensembles, other people, vocalists. But why is that so essential to playing? Um, it just breaks you out of the guitar world. You know, I think in the guitar world, we're all very self-conscious of our instrument and the, the limitations of the instrument. Um, but I, I, you can go about it in, in different ways, but playing with um, other instruments definitely teaches you that your guitar is a tool and you have to use it to create good music. And um, the, the other people don't care about your, your guitar playing. They care about whether you're playing in time and whether you're playing good harmonies and, and all those things. They, and whether you're accompanying them well, maybe, or you're working well within the ensemble and if you're arching your phrases, but they don't care about your instrument. Like if you play for another instrument, they might not care what your tone is like. You know, they're used to hearing steel string guitar. They're used to hearing all sorts of wacky guitar sounds. Um, they, they're they very focused on, on more musical ideas. And I think that that is a a broader musical world that everyone has to be uh, more in tune with. It's not that we should ignore our guitar sound or our guitar technique. It's not that, That's but that's just for your practice room. That's something you're doing alone in your practice room. It has nothing to do with the audience or your ensemble partners or music itself. Um, technique and sound is like something you're just honing in your practice sessions. But then you get into the ensemble or into concerts now you're communicating with other people, communicating with your audience. And you have to be, you have to think of what the music is sounding like and less, and less be, be less focused on guitar. Some, you know, for a while I studied, um, I took lessons from a, a violinist, uh, Dr. Walter Moni, and it was great playing for him. Like he would just scream at me to give him more volume. And I would just be trashing the guitar. It would sound so bad, but you know, in an ensemble, he was just like, if it's a Fort Sando, he wanted Fort Sando. And he didn't care if my guitar was getting pushed too far or it wasn't a beautiful guitar tone. He just wanted force. He wanted literally that accent there. And it was awesome studying with him. Like he made me just think of the guitar um, as a more of a tool and less as, as a classical guitar, which, which I think is, yeah, definitely important for people. And I think new, the new music scene is also really helpful because when you work with composers, composers, they're looking for they're looking for a sound, but it might not be, you know, the the John Williams sound or it might not be. Actually, I shouldn't put that because John Williams is actually very versatile, but um, they're not looking for the, the classical guitar, beautiful sound. They're looking for their own sound, the sound that's in their head that they want you to make with your instrument. And you have to do, you're tasked with the job to make that sound and not be confined by the classical guitar conventions. I absolutely love your insight and, and how you perceive things. And that's why I really wanted to connect with you. Uh, I've been, you know, obviously a fan of your website. Okay. And I, I love the intimacy of what we're talking about. Uh, let's, let's talk further. Um, well, actually, one thing I'll one thing I'll add to that previous conversation too is that um, having seen a lot of like new music players out there, like I have a friend Adrian Verdejo who plays pretty much exclusively new music in in Vancouver. Um, he, for example, like a lot of new music players, they're not very well known in the classical guitar world, nor are they very well renowned in the classical guitar world, and yet they're monstrously amazing musicians or someone like Seth Jossel. He's not, you know, on the cover of like, you know, soundboard all the time or something like that. But these are guitarists that are like doing amazing, amazing work and very underappreciated because they don't fit the mold of the concert classical guitarist who's playing the same old repertoire. Um, and I think that, yeah, if people could, and I try to feature new music sometimes on the site, but like if people could get, more into those artists and just appreciate um, artistry more than just the guitar. Um, yeah, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very worthwhile discussion, a very worthwhile avenue to explore for most people. How did you develop your platform? Oh, the, the website? Yeah. Um, very haphazardly with a horrible, horrible marketing plan. 
<laughs> with no marketing plan. Well, yeah, this site was created for my students. So it was developed very, um, very poorly. And it's been revamped many, 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 many times. Um, but it was, it, it started off just as a Tumblr site, like that, so, you know, the social media micro blogging, just as a way to share videos with my students. Um, because I wanted my students to see other people playing. And it was tough for young students to sometimes, you know, go to every concert, or maybe there just wasn't enough concerts, you know, in Victoria. And so, yeah, I just started sharing videos with them. I just wanted them to watch one professional, one good professional player um, once a week, because it was hard for them to go on YouTube and type in classical guitar and find someone who's good. Um, so sharing it that way um, was a great way to just share music with my students on a regular basis and just get them to watch um, a diversity of different players and so that they could learn how they sit and also get introduced to some of the repertoire. Like some of my students would come in the next week and say like, ah, I want to play some Villa Lobos or I want to play some Roland Dion's or, you know, something like that. So it was a way of just introducing them. Um, but then lots of other people followed the, followed the Tumblr and I said like, oh, I better better make a WordPress site out of it and, and get all get all technical and spend two days trying to figure out how to move a pixel in the theme over. <laughs> all What's the stuff. traffic flow like? I'm assuming it's quite large. I mean, you, you went from something that you're calling haphazard that sounded like a, a conduit for your students at first. It's now one of the main sites for classical guitar. Yeah, um, it's like a it's a funny site because there's lots of great sites out there for classical guitar and that are bigger or more professional or like run by a team and stuff like that. Um, but I guess the appeal of, of my site might be that it's well, it's free. It's free for everyone to just subscribe to and watch. And the majority of my content is just available there for for people to enjoy. So there's no reason not to follow it. <laughs> Um, if they don't want to buy sheet music, they don't, they don't have to, um, you can totally avoid that aspect of the site. I even created a store that was separate from the site so that if you don't want to buy stuff, you don't even have to go to my store. Um, uh, but yeah, there's uh, definitely, it's, it's well viewed. A um, couple million people a year visit it, which isn't big for the internet, you know, <laughs> for other, um, but it's a niche thing, of course. Um, yeah. I, I, it's, I mean, it's expanded. People come in for a variety of reasons. Surprisingly, compared to a lot of maybe my competitors, I don't think of anyone as my competitor. I, I think there's plenty of room for more websites and, and programs out there. Um, but I, I definitely have a large group of, of viewers that are age 24 to 35, which is kind of surprising because I think the majority of the industry would be more like um, 60 plus. Um, but I, I think there's lots of college students following the site just to see what pros are playing and, um, just to see what's going on. Um, just, and, um, and also they're probably just more used to subscribing to things online. So, um, they seem to, to do that. I also do try to feature young artists, um, more than anyone else, um, emerging artists. I try to feature the most. So that, that might be a reason for that too. They're probably sharing it with all their, their college friends and stuff like that. Well, you also have an incredible warm and friendly approach that is very welcoming. So bravo, bravo for that. That's um, good. <laughs> do you like to compose at all? Um, yes and no. Um, I, I would like to do more composing. Um, I'm composing a couple things right now, but I'm pretty busy most of the time and um, compo you know, good composers do it do it better than me. Um, I, I've always been interested in, in jazz as well, though. So like that has been like a different avenue for some of those creative powers, um, arranging a, a lot. Composing, I love composing, but um, I haven't got over that hump where I'm just like actively composing all the time. Because just like with anything, you just have to, you have to do it regularly and all the time. Otherwise it feels like you're trying to sit down and, and write something like on the spot for a, a very specific purpose. But that's not usually how those artistic endeavors work. Usually you write a whole bunch and there's like 5% of that might be a kernel that you could develop into something further, but you have to be doing it all the time. And uh, the last few years, well, the last, I, I taught at the Conser Victoria Conservatory for um, 16 years, and I always had like 30 students there, and I was playing concerts, 
and I was running the website and, and really just like zero time. I, I was getting to the point where I couldn't even practice anymore. Um, but after recently moving, um, I have a lot more time in my hands. So I hope that I can dive into some of those, um, those things that require some, some consistent um, exploration. So when you think of composing, are you talking about um, writing original music for either guitar or other instrumentation, or are you doing arranging for the guitar and for your site? I would probably be split it into two. Like I would probably prefer personally to not write for the guitar because I just do too much guitar. And there's, there's a whole bunch of factors about guitar that just, um, that eat away at me all the time. Um, I'm not saying that in a negative way. I love the instrument, but you know, I would love to write for other instruments too, um, to explore other sounds if I'm going to write the music myself. But also, uh, yeah, I want to write for guitar <laughs> as well. Um, particularly like for me, I mean, I'm not a big composer, so it would be probably more like impromptu etudes and, and stuff like that. Um, I definitely want to write um, a, a series of, of progressive etudes. That, that's definitely on my list just because I'm... I would like to see more etudes that are like similar to jazz etudes in the sense that there's not too much pressure to make it, um, you know, too highbrow. Um, I, I want students to have access to um, stuff that makes them practice technique in a very enjoyable way. <laughs> I loved composing in college and uh, that was when I regurgitated tons of stuff and I haven't composed much since. It's, it's definitely another head trip, a whole nother world for sure. Um, but I do miss it and I like to do some arranging. Um, tell us about what music you had sent me that we're gonna then add into this interview. That way the audience can hear about that piece and we'll loop it in later and when we upload it. Yeah, there's, um, well, it's, it's very early um, Italian loop music. And um, really some of the earliest stuff out there to some extent, um, there's not much known about Dalza, John Ambrosio Dalza, um, but these two works, it's, there's a Richa Car, which Richa Cars are kind of like a early predecessor of the Fugue, um, just really just like imitative works, um, similar to like the vocal style that was happening in the Renaissance where you have um, little tiny motifs and then they, they're passed to different voices and things like that. This particular um, Richakar is pretty loose though. There's not that much going on with it compositionally. And actually the piece that I play um, afterwards is there's not much really going on with it in terms of uh, musically speaking. It's, it's much more just on the dancey, um, very kind of like secular music, um, um, dance music of the era. Um, it's almost sounds Celtic to me um, in a way. It's like very dancey and it just rolls over itself. There's some mot motivic development, but it doesn't develop into anything. It kind of comes and goes. But I really love the, the time period and the Italian loop music of that era because it's like they're, they're, they're all very skilled musicians because they were doing vocal intabulations and things like that. So they were, they were looking at motet music and transcribing it for lutes. So they, they knew their music and they knew counterpoint very, very well. And they were all trained, I'm sure, um, in musically. But at the same time, they were writing this very, um, I don't want to say lowbrow music or something like that, but just like um, almost like bordering folk music, you know, like just very dancey. I think they were very interested in, in using the instrument to compose pieces that had the flavor of, of the time period and the geographic region. And they certainly did that very well. And also um, half of Dolls' pieces, um, some of them are very organized and, and strict in their composition. Um, and then other ones are very meandering. Um, and I like the meandering ones it's kind of like very refreshing to just kind of like play and not not be too concerned about like oh is this the development section of a piece or what's going on is there stretto in these two counterpoint piece you know parts here like there's not much to think about in 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 the works that i'm playing um those two works they're, they're really just you just listen to them and there's not much to analyze after that which is kind of charming <laughs> 
I noticed in the video that you were using a capo. Can we talk about that? We don't see that much either on classical guitar. And it's another uh, controversial topic like tablature versus notation. <laughs> right. Yeah, of course. Well, um, well, there, there's, as people probably know, there's lots of different early music lutes. So lutes with different numbers of strings. And especially when you take in the, Bar the Baroque and the Renaissance, there's lots of, a lot of different tunings. And so that's a, that's a big concern. Most of the music that I'm arranging, with the exception of, that, of some of the vice that I transcribed, um, it's pretty similar to the modern guitar. You tune down that, fourth, that third string to F sharp. And if you put a capo on there, you have an approximate tuning and pitch level of a lute. Pretty tough to say that you know, accurately. So we can just say relative lute tuning in the sense that we're, we're, we're pretty close. And um, playing with the capo on, um, I really like the sound of that for early music because it, it both, it raises the pitch level. So you get this kind of lighter um, sound, a little bit higher pitch, which might be considered closer to a lute, but maybe not. But it also frets all the strings against the metal fret, which makes all the open strings sound like fretted notes. The nut of the guitar, the, for those that don't know, the white part at the headstock, where the string contacts, that playing a string when it's connected to the nut of the guitar sounds different than when you fret a note next to the metal. It's just a different material. It just has a different sound. When you put that capo on, it kind of equalizes all the notes. And there have been luthiers that have tried to build guitars like that so that all the notes kind of sound more similar. Um, however, in modern classical guitar repertoire, open strings have a nice ping and that can be useful actually sometimes. Um, so I do it for that. I do it, there's kind of like a warmth to the capo and a raising of the pitch. And I, I tune down that third string. So I'm in the same, um, uh, so I can use the same fingering as the loop players did. And because loop players wrote with that tuning, most of the time, the fingerings are more ergonomic if you use that tuning. You know, the chord shapes that they were used to playing in the left hand um, had to do with that specific tuning. And so that's why it's so useful to use that. And getting students introduced to that early on is very important. Um, I introduced it in my method books because I have a graded repertoire series. I introduced it at the grade two or three level and in a very easy way just to get students to start using that tuning so that a whole world of music will be opened up to them. Um, I've also played with lute players quite a bit and, um, and played on, with a modern guitar with a lute and all sorts of different combinations. And um, so just becoming comfortable with that um, was a long process for me for sure. And, and reading lute tablature was, took me a little while, but I even took a course with it and, um, and I've transcribed so much of it at this point, I can really just read it unless we get into something that like German tablature, which is just ludicrous. <laughs> That's a joke too, Lute, ludicrous, loot. Like yeah. <laughs> well, I want to thank you so much for your time and, and everything that we've talked about. Like I said, I'm a big fan. And, Thanks so uh, much. I'm, I'm really excited to work on this later tonight and, and get the playing incorporated and we can share it with everybody. And I'd love Looking to stay in touch and continue our friendship. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much for having me. That's Thank very you. nice of you. All, <laughs> All right. right. Be well. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.